Hey everyone, it's your favorite host, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast. Your favorite gentleman here coming to you live. And today you all are here for a treat. This is a unique interview that is long overdue. It's an interview I've been working on literally for over a year. Um, this guest is very special coming to the stage and just a, in, a, a unique um individual that that shares and gives and he tells his story with such a profound distinction that that he's very very honest and you don't get that with some with someone of his story that's someone that's been through the ringer the way he has and i am looking forward to this interview this conversation this dialogue with my new friend mr devannon so stay tuned stay with us here we go Welcome to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show, and I have the incredible Mr. Devannon Huber coming to the Gentleman Style Podcast. So this man has done it all, been through it all. He's the author of his famous book, Sex, Drugs, and Jesus. It, this is a dedicated memoir about his struggles with drug addiction, drug dealing, homelessness, serving in the armed forces contracting HIV and Hep B and rejection from his church for his sexuality. Mr. Devanna is also the host of his incredible podcast, Sex, Drugs, and Jesus Podcast, and is the owner of the Down Under Apparel. He owns his own clothing brand. This is not your typical rags to riches. This man has put in the work, he's done the time, and he's here to give back and share with my audience his incredible um, gut-wrenching story. Help me welcome to the stage the incredible Mr. Devanna Humor. Hello, 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 hello. What an incredible introduction, man. I was over here just rocking out with my cock out <laughs> to your uh <laughs> to your theme song. Shit, it hits hard. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm glad that I worked hard. And you did the work, man. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. And thank you for giving back in this way. I, I appreciate that that compliment. Sir, you have been through the ringer, so your journey has not been easy. And 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 what made you decide to to after everything you've been through? Most people would have curled up in a ball, they would have given up on life. You know, you, but you pushed through, you persevered. What is the purpose for your memoir? What was the goal there? Well, I did curl up into a ball and I did give up on life. But then I was, <laughs> and, and you know, God was, God, it was who it was who resurrected me, who unfurled me from that ball and who put life in me again. Mm -hmm. And so the purpose of this memoir is to show Trans very transparently how one can be curled up into a ball and give up on life, but then how you can come up out of that. Because knowledge is what breaks us free. And so this book is full of truth and transparent knowledge that is gonna help people to know that they're not alone, no matter what it is they're going through. That's so true. And that helps, and, that, and that's necessary. Too many times we experience, right, falsehoods or people hide these things. Um, you, you have a, a extensive history. What was your experience like in the armed forces? What was that like? And thank you for your service, by the way. Oh, anytime. I'd, I'd like to say I'd do it again, but I would probably wait till I wasn't 17. And, you know, I went in when I was 17, so I don't recommend that necessarily. Um, it was bittersweet. The military is just a bitch. You know, they don't tell you the truth. They lie to the service members and everything like that. But, you know, I'm 17 and from the country, you know, in Louisiana. So I don't really know about like life, life. Um, by the time I began to become an adult and saw how the Air Force worked, like when I was a military recruiter, I was an Air Force recruiter in Southern California. And so they would they would tell me to lie to the applicants about the jobs that they were going to be doing in the Air Force. So and I was like, no, I'm not going to lie to my recruits. And then. So that created conflict. Um, 
I began to express myself. I wore piercings and stuff like that. They didn't want any individuality in the Air Force. They wanted you to conform. I got Article 15s, almost got threw out a couple of times. And then I wasn't straight. And during those days, you had don't ask, don't tell. So I couldn't go get a boyfriend. I couldn't marry anyone. I couldn't do it right. So then I became a hoe. Right. Right. And then and, and that that conflict was was detrimental to you. That conflict of you can't talk about who you are and talk about how you feel. Right. And you felt like you just were a fraud. You you, you felt just deceived. Like, I don't want to deceive anybody. I don't want to lie to anybody. And so you transitioned out. And so um, later on in your journey, your your memoir, you you wrote the book, literally wrote the book on this can you tell us what people can expect from this book your memoir sex drugs and jesus oh lots of filth i must say i am quite impressed with the sex scenes <laughs> in this in this book uh i wanted that authenticity because you know when you think of any kind of show that you love they always have a whole lot of sex because we're all sexual beings we love watching other people have sex we love hearing other people have sex even if it's through the wall at a hotel room or in your apartment we love thinking about it because it's, it's as natural to us as breathing and needing water so i wanted the realness of of that reality to be there you're going to find a lot of religious conflict you know, as I go from being like a Pentecostal altar boy to somebody who's like against, you know, a lot of organized religion and churches altogether, um, you'll find um, a lot of candidacy about the process of becoming a drug dealer, shooting up drugs, how it feels to get high in that type of way, running from the police. There's a lot of running from like the police and stuff like that. And um, and you get that inside look into jail. You know, we've seen uh, Orange is the New Black and all of that. In my book, I give you a pretty good snapshot of what it's like inside a gay tank. So like in Harris County in Houston, Texas, you have like a whole like cell just for like gay people, non-straight people and honey. It gets petty from the Destiny's Child renditions with the torn bed sheets to making the cakes out of honey buns and everything in between. <laughs> Why did they separate? Why did they separate you all from the rest of the inmates? It was my request. You know, okay. some jails do that because for safety. If you put like, say, a trans man or a trans woman or somebody who's rather effeminate like myself into a tank full of straight dudes who are all like muscly and, and shit like that, you would probably get our ass beat. You get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. it's for safety. Now, that makes sense. Now, some of the straight guys lie about being straight, you know, because they probably got enemies in the straight tank and they don't want to go in there and get fucked up either. So then they lie to come into the straight tank. For, I mean, they, they lie to come into the gay tank for protection. Because it's safer. It's safer. <laughs> so there's no drama. There's no drama in, in that tank versus oh, the rest. It's plenty of drama. It's drama. But it's not violent drama. Like, ain't nobody toting like a razor or a sawed-off toothbrush to shank your ass with. It's not that type of drama. It's like, who stole my cookies, you know, or who is she? You know her. You know, it's that petty drag queen type of drama. Now, there may have been a fight or two, but wasn't nobody trying to kill nobody, you know, none of that. But it is plenty dramatic from the first hallelujah to the last amen. <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take you to write your memoir the write the book how long did that process take okay i started taking notes in 2013 and then the outline was pinned about just over two years ago so oh at, at least two years functionally it, but it took the greater part of a decade to gather all my thoughts makes sense makes sense so told y'all this man is the truth he's going to, he's going to tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not and 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 this is this is insight knowledge this is insight perspective that um some of us have never seen or expected mr devanan that you were a drug dealer you have insight knowledge um into that world Again, I and we we talked a little bit offline, y'all. We, we we conversed before the show, 
And I told him, I, I tried my hand. I'm from the Caribbean. I tried my hand at, at, at being a gangster. <laughs> and it, it didn't work. I was an academic. It didn't work out. I would try and buck to people, and I was just, like, punked all the time. It, it, it didn't work. <laughs> what was your experience like being a drug dealer? How was that um, transition for you? And why did, why did you get into it in the first place? Well, I was a more of a glamorous, you know, fashionista, you know, drug dealer. I was in it for the, for the, for the power, for the, for the glory of it all. I already had a job making thirty-five or seventy dollars an hour, depending on overtime, double time, that type of thing. Um, I just, you know, I did it seeking family, seeking communion. I mean, community. And so I had got kicked out of church. I was serving at Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas. I was a volunteer there in many different ministries, and that was my family. I had been volunteering in church since I was about in the eighth grade. And all of this happened. I got fired from, from Lakewood Church from volunteering for since I wasn't straight. They found a scandalous photo on my MySpace page and decided that I had to go. They didn't want me around children or anything like that, basically saying that I'm a pedophile because I'm not straight. You know how some dumbass people are. They're like, well, if you're not straight, then that means you want to fuck children. And so that's that's the sort of stuff that um, that, that that people at Lakewood propagate. That's how they think. That's how they feel. And so it was my fault for lying on the application. When I was filling out the application to volunteer in the children's ministry as a teacher, as a worship leader, they had on the application that if you are not straight, we don't want you around children. I should have run right then and not fooled with the church and everything like that. But I was like, okay, this is another one of those don't ask, don't tell moments. Just like when I was in the Air Force, I just got out of the Air Force. I was like, okay. But it wasn't the case with them. They really literally, if you're not straight, they don't want you volunteering there. And so I felt very dehumanized. My tribe was taken from me. And I'm like in my mid-20s and very reckless and very immature still, even though I'm thinking I'm not. I didn't know how much we seek community everywhere we go. So I went to seek that community in the only place I knew I wouldn't be judged, which was at the nightlife. So I know I can go to these gay bars and they're not going to tell me that I can't come in here because of who I hang out with. You know, they're not going to do that. And so I got more entrenched. People started to look at me like I was a drug dealer. I would just be like hanging out at a bar sometimes and they just kind of give me like that look, you know, a signal. And I was like, hmm, wait, what was that? What was that? I missed that. What's the signal? I need to learn. This is my street. This is me building street cred. Yeah. So I would probably have on like a fedora or something like that. And everyone, everyone else probably had on some type of hat or something. So if you're standing at a bar and you think you're looking at a drug dealer, because, you know, drug dealers have a certain type of look. You know, if you pay attention, you know, all it takes is a is an eyebrow raise, a wink, a little, you know, something like that. And this the energy between the two of you two. That drug dealer got what you want. You really pressing for it. You will you will find each other. And um, I had never tried drugs before. Um, you know, this guy, because I was always at church. I was at church like at least 10 hours a week volunteering. And, you know, I didn't have time for drugs and I was against it because of my religious affiliation. Once I got kicked out of Lakewood, I stopped going to church altogether. It took me like five years before I went to church again because I was confused. I thought I was worshiping God, but apparently I was worshiping Joel Osteen on some level, too, because if that wasn't the case, then when they fired me, then I would have just went and worshiped God somewhere else. But you see, I had conflated the two and we do that all the time. We be worshiping churches and preachers and we don't realize it. And that's what I was doing, and I didn't realize it. Um, so this guy asked me if I wanted ecstasy. I had never done drugs before. I was like 27, 28. And I was still rebelling against this experience that had happened at Lakewood. And I was like, well, fuck it. Let's do it. So every drug and everything that I used to say no to when I was serving at church, I started to say yes to, you know, out of pure rebellion. And me being the businessman that I am, I started buying more drugs. And I was like, OK, if I get more drugs, I can get this at a lower rate. So like, OK, so if I get this at this low rate, I can sell this shit to my friends and make money off of them to cover my habit. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait a minute. So wait a minute. Wait, I want to break this down. So if you got drugs for you to sell, you would get it at like if you ordered in bulk or something, you would get at a discount. Right. And then. So, OK. Right. So say, for instance, if I'm going to get a gram of crystal meth, 
um, a hundred hundred dollars. Let's just say it's gonna be a hundred dollars. If I get an eight ball, it might be a hundred and eighty dollars, and an eight ball is three point five grams of meth. So it's like wholesale. Like if you go into Sam's Club, if you just get one unit, it might be ten dollars. If you agree to get ten units, then it might be five dollars per unit. The more oh. you get, the more you save. The same shit works in the drug world. Okay. But not everybody wants to sell to their friends or sell at all. And I'm not realizing just the gratitude the gravity of what it means to get a felony because I'm just like, okay, this is fun. I can make money and then I can provide to my friends what they want. I still very much had the heart of self-deprecation, humanitarianism and volunteerism. I just started doing it this way. I'm like, okay, I want to serve people. I can serve them dope. Yeah. So, you know. There was a moral code to you. You were like, 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 did you sell to kids or, or pregnant women? No, I didn't have access to children, you yeah. know, um, and no pregnant women that I guess I or they knew of. But, you know, you had to be grown and probably not straight because I was right in the heart of Montrose, which is the gay district in Houston, Texas. So now I sold to grown ass people who knew what the fuck they wanted. <laughs> so, no, though, I could be quite persuasive, too. When did you <laughs> when did you that's a good salesman right there. When did you get out the game? When did you decide or or did you decide or were you pushed out? Were you forced out? When did you make that transition out of, of selling drugs? Okay, so SWAT came probably at the peak of my dealing. I, I'll say this. The people I was getting my crystal meth from, and I sold everything, meth, Lyrica, cocaine, crack, XC, Vicodin, Laura Which said, one made the most money? Cocaine, meth. Cocaine was the most okay. Cocaine and meth. I like selling to the tweakers to the meth people because they were my because that's the drug I used the most. But it's way riskier selling to tweakers. Cocaine is a cleaner process. You know, you just dropping off eight balls to the bar to your posh upscale friends. The tweakers, you gotta. It's gonna be a whole sketchy thing trying to figure it all out and line it all up. But it was entertaining and it kept me busy and kept my mind off of healing. I didn't want to think about the pain that I was still suffering from Lakewood. And so, and so, um, SWAT came. So the people I was getting the dope from, they were probably moving about maybe two, three kilos of meth a day. And so, uh, high level meth cooks and, and shit like that is who I was fucking with. And so I was moving enough weight, you know, to get their attention and for them to do business with me. Um, some of them were hooked up with like Aryan nation, uh, people never believe me when I talk about Aryan Nation because Aryan Nation is known to be very racist and stuff like that. But I'm going to tell you, if you can make money, there are certain people in the Aryan Brotherhood who don't give a damn if you're black or gay. Right. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> you got straight white people who cannot move the amount of drugs that I was moving. So they, quite frankly, didn't give a damn. <laughs> about about your race or, Yeah. Which was better? Which was better? Love and acceptance. The Lakewood Church showed me because they were very concerned about <laughs> my right. sexual orientation and not just whether or not I could do the damn job, right? <laughs> and, so, and do it well, and do it well, and do it very well. And so, but I was, I got reckless. I got HIV. I found out I got was HIV positive on a voicemail on New Year's Eve, 2011, I believe it was. I had a shitty ass doctor, and um. And so I got reckless. I started slipping up and I started getting arrested. Like five days later, after I got that diagnosis, I caught my first case. And then it, it, and it just went downhill from there. You know, SWAT came, kicked the door in. We're talking at least 20, 30, 40 um, armed men, semi-automatic rifles, Kevlar vests, face shields, K-9 units, helicopters, battering ram, you know, all of that. And so they was trying to shut my ass down. And so that's <laughs> wow. <laughs> that look that look on your face. <laughs> no, I'm 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 fascinated, right? Because this is not a movie anymore, right? This is real life. We see it in, in movies. Like, was it the high life that they they personified to be? Like, were you renting private jets and yacht parties and all of that stuff? I mean, what's the most you ever made? I guess in a week or a month? Like, was it the high life that they show it to be? Or not really because you're on it. You could probably say like maybe like a few thousand in a week. But remember, I didn't need the money. You didn't need it. That, that wasn't what I was in it for. 
I wanted the power. I had power over people and I could get, you know, big, strong men. And I'm only like 130, 40 pounds in this during this time. So it was fascinating to me that I could get a guy who was like 6'2 and just completely very you know, muscular and tattooed to, to, to bend to my will for a, shard, for a shard of dope. You know, and there's all kinds of psychology there as to why it was important to me to feel like I was in control in this situation. Um, I didn't stop selling until after I got back to Louisiana. I was on probation. They transferred my probation from Texas to Louisiana to give me greater odds for success. And my pastor, Evangelist Nelson, my personal spiritual counselor, my prophetess, the one who prayed to me out of every last one of these terrible situations that I got my ass into, made me promise her that I would not sell drugs again. Okay. <laughs> And that is why I stopped because she made me promise, you know, using is one thing, but being like the source of the drugs is like a worse thing, like the way the criminal system looks at you. Because technically speaking, using drugs is not illegal. Like there's no law against the uses of drugs. There's laws against public intoxication, the sale, manufacture, distribution, and transfer, but there's no law against using drugs. Right. For your, so, for your own self. Yeah. And so, um, so that is why, that is when I stopped. And this is back in 2012, 2013 ish that I had to let it go. But it's not, you know, it was, it was hard because see, when you're asking somebody to let go of, say, if they were being homeless, like I was homeless roaming the streets after the drug raid, that's how I became homeless. You can't really like go back to your apartment after they threw you out for being a drug dealer. And then my mind was overthrown and I thought that I was going to be dead in a few months anyway from the HIV that I just lost my will to live. And um, and so when you ask somebody to give up being homeless, to give up being a drug dealer, you're asking them to, to let go of all that they know, everything that they're familiar with. So we look at people who are homeless or drug dealers. It's easy to judge, to look down on. But that's just like if a homeless person came up to you and be like, would you give up your house in your career and in your children? Just give it all up because I think the way you're living is bad. Right. You ain't going to do that. You're going to look at them like they fucking crazy. But that's, that's all I know. Yeah. Right. It, but it's a community out there on those streets and those tent cities under those bridges. It's family. And and. And some people have had things and they just want to be homeless for right now. They don't want to be bothered with responsibility. So it's not for us to look at them and in, in any kind of way other than they're living there, whatever their truth is right now, end of story, done. And shut the fuck up about it because you just don't know, <laughs> you know, why people are doing what they're doing. When you so after the drug bus, you became homeless and and because you couldn't go back to the way things were and and this this lady prayed you out of your situation and she made you make a promise. What was that like? What was that transition like for homelessness? And how did you get out of that? How did you build yourself back up from there? You had to reinvent yourself, I imagine. Once you've lost everything, it's beautiful and then it's also terrible. Because you have a clean blank slate with, with, with which upon which you can redraw yourself now. But at the same time, you have a clean blank slate, which means you ain't got shit. So, you know, I had to begin the wardrobe again. Okay, let's start with five pairs of pants, five shirts. You know, I went from having enough clothes in my closet to change clothes twice a day. And I did. I had one outfit for when the sun was up and one outfit for when the sun was down. And I could probably go six months at least without wearing the same thing twice. You know, from being to, okay, I got a couple of pairs of shorts and a couple of shirts. Okay, I had to start off being a janitor because I couldn't get a job anywhere, cleaning up literal shit and piss behind people at the VA hospital uh, clinic here in Baton Rouge. But you see, it's a mental thing. My mind was used to being on the street. So the VA was, you know, they bought me an apartment, the Department of Veterans Affairs, you know, so I had an apartment. My parents got me a little used for focus to start getting around with. I would still walk out at night and talk to homeless people, even though I had a, an apartment now because my mind was still there. It took years for me to actually believe that I wasn't homeless, even though I had an apartment. You know, and it took me years to begin to feel like I could talk to you and be accepted by, I guess you could say, the regular society, you know, 
because I had got so used to it. And then people judge you if you are homeless or if you're a janitor like I was. You know, you go somewhere, they're like, oh, what do you do? You know, I'm a janitor. People feel a need to react to that. They'll say something like, oh, there's no need to be ashamed of that or nothing like that. Although they're straight up judge, <laughs> you know, and be like, well, I hope you have enough money to pay for shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, they're judging you even though they're like telling you there's no shame. They're still looking down on you in a way. Yeah, it doesn't work. You don't have to say anything. If you meet somebody and they're like, I'm a janitor, I'm a vlogger, I'm a prostitute, I sell my pussy or whatever. Did you just fucking nod your head and go on about your damn business? You don't have to. But people ask that question to judge people anyway. I don't ask people that question when I meet them because who really cares? Unless you're at a networking event, maybe. And then maybe if it's a very specific networking event, very niche thing, then I could totally see that prospering. But usually it's to size you up. You know, what do you do? If you say doctor, lawyer, dentist, you get a, ah, if you say janitor, food delivery driver, maybe not so much. It's like they're trying to figure out where to place you. So put I you in a box. Question. Yeah, put you in a box. And it, and it's true. It's, 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 it's twofold, right? We identify, sometimes we identify, when I ask you, who are you? If I ask you, Devannon, Hubert, who are you? You know, without a shadow of doubt, who you are. But some people place themselves by their profession. I am the dentist. I am the doctor, right? And 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 that's where you see that comment in military. Um, I experienced that in military. I, I consider it a form of PTSD because if I ask you, hey, who are you? Well, I used to do this, or I used to do that, or I'm, you know, I used to do this in the Navy. I didn't ask you that. I said, who are you? And that is where, you know, people need to draw the line and separate the two. And but the problem is we identify by what we do and how much we make as to who we are. And that's not that's not true. So you're 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 speaking profound on, on something that's a huge problem. And, and and you're right. I don't care what you do. I don't care if you're a doctor or a janitor. You have a good heart. You have a great heart. You're a good person and you mean well. And you don't mean me harm. You know, like that's really what you want to know that's really what i want to know are you are you gonna hurt me you know that type of thing so yeah huge huge yeah and you know thank you for saying that i you know what that reminds me of is the uh the common thread that i found that narcotics how narcotics attaches people at every rung of the social ladder because when i was a drug dealer i sold to doctors attorneys mm. lawyers Mm. Yeah, hell, the doctors made made my fucking Molly for me. <laughs> right, right. You're upstanding citizens. You should go to some of these mansion parties. Okay, now I did all that. You know, going to the mansion party selling drugs to really, really rich people. Yes. <laughs> all Teddy, the people of high society we thought. Look, titties flopping all over the place, champagne on ice, pimp sweets, Ferraris, you know, out front. Yes. People, everybody fucking does, does drugs from the homeless person up to the C, E, and the O. Right. Everybody, you know, that, that, that. True. Super uh, true. You're in it. You are giving me life, brother. We have one quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right, right back. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be back. Good day, podcast listeners. This is your boy, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I wanted to let you guys know that we will be rolling out a new feature and adding a join sponsor button next to the subscriber button here at the bottom of your screen. Once you click the button, it will display three membership levels. Gentleman Gentry, which is our entry level. Duke Duchess, which is our season level and the Emperor and Empress, which is our most sophisticated level, which you will receive unique perks and benefits at each differing level and gain access to our community tab. We will also be sharing polls, upcoming events, and interviews, as well as receive feedback from our sponsors directly. Your support helps me find new and exciting guests to bring to the stage live. Well, in order to get the higher end speakers, it requires, well, some, you guessed it, money. So thank you for tuning in to my channel. And if becoming a sponsor sounds good to you, then select the join button below and choose your desired sponsor level. Let's continue to grow 
and serve the future of generations of men and women to come. Love you guys. Bye. Support for Gentleman Style Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers you precision engineering tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code GENSTYLE at manscaped.com. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. We have the incredible Devanna Huber. This man is incredible. Spilling the tea on what it was like to be a, a, a drug dealer, go from homeless, being a veteran in the military, and how he, he is, again, rags to riches. But it's not your ordinary, common, heard story. That you're, like, you're not going to get this on Netflix, even though it should be on Netflix, right? But you're not going to get this anywhere else except on his channel and here on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. Uh, Mr. Devaney, you touched on something um, that I wanted to, to dive a little deeper with you. When you when you discovered that you were HIV positive and how you felt like you didn't have nothing to live for, uh, how did, that news had to be just epic. And and how did you bounce back? Because you you're alive now, you're here today, but back then you didn't feel that way. How did you get through that transition? The reason I thought I was going to die was because everybody who I knew to have had had HIV had died of AIDS. You know, not of old age. And me and my friends, if I would even call them that, were too busy running around looking cute, trying to act like we were perfect and had it all together. None of us were discussing our weaknesses with each other. Later on, I would find out other people I, I knew had HIV, but no one was talking about it. And so therefore, when I got it, I thought I was literally like the only one that I was totally alone and completely isolated. That's another reason why I, I went hard with my book was because I feel like I would have made different decisions that I had more knowledge about HIV and just about how it's okay to be weak and have something bad happen to you. And so that's why I thought it was going to happen. That's where I got that lie in my head from, you know, I didn't know about medicine, I didn't know about treatment. I didn't feel like I wanted to go and get it. You know, I, was just, I have a very deterministic mind and personality. And so that's what got me into that trap. And so it's my hope that when people, and people even to this day, when they get HIV, it doesn't matter how much medicine and how too much treatment has come, it, it sucks to feel like your body has been invaded by something that you cannot get rid of. <laughs> You know, all my thoughts of, oh, I'm going to live forever, cheat death, find the fountain of life, all that came crashing down and my mortality was sealed. You know, the you know the moment that I heard that voicemail, which I would go on to replay countless times to hear if I could hear something different, you know, I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to be a, a pretty diva drug dealer for the rest of my life, not a, a dribbled up corpse with HIV, which was the only recollection, the only reference that I had you know, for it. I didn't know anybody was healthy and living with HIV. Yeah. And so there's something to be said of that, of how you give someone information. Now, had they brought me into the office with a social worker, a psychologist and all of that and explained things to me, that probably would have gone over a bit differently had they left it on a voicemail on New Year's Eve and I was already high and drunk by the time I you know, got the message. You know, so the, it was a really dick move on the part of that doctor, and you'll fuck him wherever he's at. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> but that's that's that was the missing piece, and you you feel that you would have transitioned better, um, had the information been brought to you better in a more professional, more outstanding. Like, hey, there is a life after this, and I have a room full of professionals, or I know some professionals that can help see you through, and this is not the end yeah. right so when doctors do it right man they bring you into the office and they have the social worker and the psychiatrist and everyone present so they can see how you react and they're not going to let you leave there if they think you have suicidal ideations or you may do something to hurt yourself 
or if you don't have a clear understanding on the options that are available to you. Now, compare and contrast that to just flinging the shit on a voicemail and hoping for the best. Uh, <laughs> it's almost like they gave up on you. And and yeah. It's, right. It's, it gives a bad presentation. It gives you almost a feeling of hopelessness. Like, okay, well, we'll see what he does with this voicemail and just, yeah. Yeah. Because you don't want, once you let somebody leave the office, you don't know if they're going to come back. You know, but at least you can know that you did all you could to help them. If you give them life threatening news over the voicemail, and I've heard of people doing this with cancer diagnoses too, you know, you don't know what that person might do, you know, what their frame of reference is. And sure, we might sign these waivers at the doctor's offices saying it's okay to leave things on our voicemail, but we expect the doctor to use at least a modicum of discretion and intelligence. We want you to leave. Cause you know, you know, good happy shit on the voicemail, you know, like that. Don't leave HIV and cancer on a voicemail, no matter what we signed, you idiot. <laughs> but this is when you're dealing with people who haven't been through things of themselves, they haven't suffered, they don't understand problems and pain. All they understand is their prestige and their money and, and what works for them. You know, they don't have empathy. I don't deal with doctors anymore. I have a nurse practitioner. He has the same prescribing power. It's just like dealing with a doctor, but a doctor who has a soul. <laughs> so true. So I don't. I, I do nurse practitioners, and I highly recommend them to people. Makes sense. And then, like the Texas Medical Board, the medical board stand behind the doctor. So when you want to complain, they're going to side with the doctor no matter what. They really? don't care. So the Texas Medical Board was basically like, "Fuck me," you know. They're going to stand with the doctor and be done with it. Really. It's terrible. These are the things. And this is what I was talking about, y'all. This is the truth. Um, I did a, a recent episode, a recent interview on, you know, don't take the COVID vaccine. But you see a common theme here where just the medical system is just failing in different areas and just failing. It's not the happy go lucky stuff that you see where it's like, we are here for you. And here's the cure to your whatever ails you in. You know, the Judas Society of Cancer Treatment, you know, we 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 stick by you and we house you like here it is the raw truth on the other side of the coin right here. So thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Huber. This is this is full transparency. I wasn't expecting this. I was like, whoa, that's a king. I mean, I was expecting it, but I was like, this is raw. This is the truth. And I want to talk about the barrage of emotions that come along with an HIV infection. The other reason I wrote my book and I do my podcast and everything is that hopefully I can get people to stop judging other people. I want to give you this insight because, you know, we judge people from the outside looking in. I'm trying to tell you to learn to step inside people's minds and in their hearts before you draw these conclusions. First of all, you don't have to draw conclusions about other people. You do have the choice to not make it not have an opinion one way or the other. But like. So when I first got arrested, one of my siblings who I don't affiliate with anymore because they're judgmental had already decided I was going to die and all of this and all of that. They didn't talk to me to find out what was going on from my perspective. They projected on me what they had seen other people in their life go through. And that was not fair to me. You got to talk to me, see what's going on with me before you decide that, you know, you've drawn all the conclusions before you even dial the phone number. <laughs> and so what was the point? So when I got HIV, I felt huge guilt, shame, remorse. I blamed myself. I felt entirely irresponsible. And so I began to beat myself up and to demonize myself and to be hard on myself, which wasn't healthy. But I'm just telling you the emotions. And in any of the documentaries or films or the education that I had seen about HIV, I, none of them had ever talked about the emotional and mental weight that you're crushed with when you get when you get the disease. And that was something I couldn't handle, and it caused me to have a nervous breakdown. As it as it as expected, as anyone you know, anyone getting getting it the, the way you did, getting finding out that news the way you did, um, I I can't imagine how I would react or, or anyone, right? And like you said, just getting to know the person instead of again labeling them and trying to put them in a box like, oh, you're part of this clique now, or you're part of this societal group, and that's not the case. It's not the case. And that needs to stop. Stop. Stop trying to figure out. Trying to stop trying to put people in a box. Wow. 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 But Mr. Mr. Devanin, 
This is huge. Um, and I wanted you touched on this earlier because I asked you the question. You said it offline, but it's important enough, I think, worth repeating. And so you shared that one of the things that didn't occur with you that you would like to may have prevented you from possibly going into selling drugs um, by as a parent, parents should maybe consider introducing things early on versus hiding it and keeping it a secret. Can you speak on that? I, that it's worth repeating, I feel. I have all the respect in the world for parents who I view as sensible, realistic, and down to earth. It really, as we might say here in the South, it really cooks my grits, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> When I have a friend who's like a mom, usually it's the mom, and I might say like fuck or shit or some cuss word around their kid, and they're like, oh, Dios mio, you know, I'm like, oh, you cannot say that around my child. And I'm all like, wait a minute. This kid lives on planet Earth, and you were pregnant with him for nine months. I refuse to believe that you didn't say one cuss word, and no one you were around said one cuss word. So this inordinate sense of protection over children is the very thing that could end up hurting them one day you can literally love someone to death in that way because you, the, okay for kids in this earth they just some things are going to be exposed to drug sex religion politics you know cuss words <laughs> you know alcohol <laughs> in you that order you're right <laughs> <laughs> you can't steal, you, you can't shield them from the rudiments and for the bad things if you want to call them bad things i just think it's real things you can't shield them from that and, you know when we tell somebody not to go and do something it's like an afro it's like an aphrodisiac it's like the more something pulls away from you the more you want to go and see if you can take on the challenge of acquiring it whereas if you put something right in front of somebody and tell them all about it and give them free reign to do it they'll probably get bored with it sooner than sooner than later because you took the taboo out of it we all like danger on some level that's why we get on roller coasters that's why we go on these scandalous sexual adventures and get on these apps and go fuck people we barely know you know that's why we sell drugs and stuff like that we like the thrill we need the adrenaline re release their general adrenaline rush and so if you tell a kid a curious kid you know, don't do that. Of course he's gonna go and do it. And so the way to, um, and then then the kid's probably gonna look at you like you're fucking crazy too, because with technology, they know how to find out everything anyway. You don't want me to cuss around your kid. Okay, they, they cuss on ABC, NBC, I mean, okay. BET, yeah, MTV. The kid's just gonna look at you like you're not real, and that's, that could cause a rift in between you, or you, you and the kid. Or you can just be like, look, these are cuss words. Here's how you can use them. These are drugs. This is where homeless people live. This is what heroin is. This is what meth is. That's kind of what they tried to do with the whole dare to keep the kids off drug program. But them few little classes in elementary school is not the same as a parent, you know, or maybe even older simply taking a kid under their wing. If you control the narrative and tell your children about drugs, sex, alcohol, things like that they're going to be more responsible when they get older and they probably really won't be all thrilled about it you know and stuff like that so like my parents taught me about alcohol they only let us drink for like holidays and stuff like that mm -hmm. so i don't have an alcohol problem I can, and i've never been an alcoholic but they didn't tell me about drugs they didn't teach me about sex and i'm the youngest kid and everybody in the whole family knew about all these things and they just left me to the wind so i found out about sex from red shoe diaries real sex scrabble vision and then I learned about drugs from people I met on Grinder and Adam for Adam, you know, you know, hookup apps. Now, had my parents taught me about the shit or at least an older sibling, I would have had a different perspective. But I learned about this shit from people who had no who really didn't have my best interest in mind. Wow. So I'm telling you to get ahead of the world because they're going to learn about it all one way or the other. That's true. That's true. I, the, it was unique for me to come across. I have a friend, um, his kids. Um, he, it, it, he allows them to drink and he's allowed them to drink for years. Right. Um, probably, probably if I had to guess, probably even before the legal age, but because he removed that mystery, like you said, that aphrodisiac and he just introduced like, Hey, you want a beer? You want some wine here? Have it, ha have it here in this safe environment, in this safe space and have a drink with me 
versus discovering it out in the world where you could potentially become hurt. And it was just unique to me because I was literally in their house. We were having, um, I think we were having dinner and just his, his, his son just walks in the door. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take a beer. Like he asks, he goes around and anybody wants something to drink. And I say the virgin thing, right? I say, I'll take some water. And his, his son who's younger than me is like, I'll take a beer dad. And the, and the other son is like, I'll take some wine. And I'm like, what in the world? But it's because he introduced it to them early on. They, they never sought it anywhere else. They, and when they did, it wasn't it wasn't an enigma. They were used to it. They were they could they could get around it. And they said they knew how to be safe around it because they had the conversation early. So, yeah, you're, you're speaking facts right there. Huge, huge, huge. Uh, I want to ask today, how what is your stance being a part of the LGBT, LGBTQIA community? What is your relationship with God now? Oh, I love Jesus with all my heart and soul. I'm so glad I got kicked out of Lakewood Church because it was a kick in my ass that I needed to get better aligned with God. Um, so here's the thing about the LGBTQIA plus community. Okay, if somebody identifies as that way, there are gay affirming churches, uh, some of the Presbyterian churches, Lutheran, metropolitan community churches, places you can go and they're not going to tell you you're going to burn in hell for not being straight. Okay, there has never been a, a solid reason for us to ever think that gays and God couldn't get along. We got that idea from people who identify as straight, interpreting the Bible and using it as a weapon against people who are unlike them. Okay. And so it's easy to see, or if you put some effort into it, I'm not going to say it's easy because it depends on how bad you want to know. I read the Bible in its original languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. I don't let nobody interpret it for me. You can control it, let somebody have it. In all of these different versions, King James, like a thousand different versions of the Bible, none of those are the original language none of them some of them do a better job than others of getting you close to word for word but men have taken liberties like say the word homosexual was only added within the last century that's not a hebrew or a greek or aramaic word the term does not exist so just the fact that we know that that people have taken liberties like that to alter the meaning of the bible means that there's people who want to control the narrative of what is understood the Bible is a Middle Eastern book, not American. I don't care how many people try to act like they're an expert on it. It ain't their book. <laughs> okay, it's not. Period. And so when I was in seminary, you could, for a while I was going to be a whole preacher and get a whole degree and everything. And I stopped that because one of the one of the, the, the law professor in seminary school, I was at the Houston Graduate School of Theology in Houston, Texas. He was just like in class one day, he was just like, yeah, we want to control people in the church and everything like that. And he just blatantly said it. And I did a double take and I was like, the fuck you say? You know, he was like, you know, we want to control people in church. He said it just as casually as trees are green and water is wet. It, and he just moved on with the with the with the lecture. And I was like, oh, hell no, I'm not in this to try to dominate people. But if you look at churches, they have agendas. They got money they need to make. They're full of insecure ass people who are in charge, who very much want to control you and tell you what to do. And so my message to people is to learn how to get into that Bible and to read it for themselves, to look at churches like they're the businesses that they are and do not let a human being tell you what's right or wrong. OK, Jesus already came to handle that for you anyway. And so you don't need to go to a preacher to get forgiven of your sins. You don't need to, for him to tell you your life is okay. Half of them are fucked up anyway. But when these scandals come out with these preachers, I don't touch my pearls and fall out on the ground. I'm all like, yeah, well, he human. Uh, yeah, he did the shit. Whatever. <laughs> you, know, you know, pass me my martini. This is not news to me because I expected it. You know, so the fact that people are shocked when preachers show up doing things let us know that we made gods out of preachers. Why wouldn't an imperfect human make a mistake? Just because he's a preacher, he is not God. And so I don't care the, these pedestals they let themselves get put on. And people get hurt, you know, because we give these churches so much damn power over us when we've always had the power ourselves. God sent his son here not for us to be oppressed by organized religion, but for us to be made free to, to access God on our own. 
So I read the Bible. I don't see anything in there that's anti that where God's telling you that if you're gay, you're going to go to hell. If another person reads it, they see that. Okay. Everybody's entitled to their own interpretation. The thing is this, though. The point of reading the Bible is to go through it to find out how we can improve ourselves, not wrong with well, not what's wrong with somebody else. You know, there's no reason, there's no excuse for person A to read the Bible and be like, well, according to these scriptures, I think person B is going to go to hell or they're wrong. Okay, the, the inherent arrogance and the inherent projection and deflection of approaching the word of God to try to see what's wrong with somebody else <laughs> just reflects back on the person who's making these accusations. What we can do is not let people terrorize us with the Bible because there's not enough people telling people it's okay for them to read the Bible and interpret it on their own. The narrative is you need a preacher, you need an organization, you need this, you need that. So then people in my community will go and kill themselves over what a preacher said the Bible means rather than reading the Bible for themselves. This is a huge soapbox I dance all over and I'm going to say this and I'm going to shut up about it. But when the Bible was originally interpreted, all of these different translations the fact that you have this many translations lets you know how hard Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic is. If, if these were simple romance languages, you wouldn't have needed to be interpreted but one damn time. And then we would have banged the gavel and got off stage. The fact that you need to keep revisiting it and you got fifth, all these different translations lets you know it. it is very subjective. And um, But when it was done, though, you had a bunch of white men interpreting this shit. They didn't have Hebrews and Greeks and Aramaics in there. They didn't have black people. They didn't have women. They didn't have people who weren't straight. And so that's why when you read through the Bible, women aren't counted. <laughs> you know, we, I think we may see one or two black people <laughs> show up and then the gays have just run, run out of town. Everything is our fault. <laughs> you know, and so and why is this? Who in the hell did the interpreting? You know, women just barely got were able to vote before black people could, <laughs> you know. So I'm going to talk about that, you know, just think about that, y'all, because I can. I can go all day on that one. <laughs> I knew it was a hot topic for you, and, and that's why that's why I wanted to bring it up. I knew it was a sense of 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 just because that's the transition, that's the 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 melding point, the melting pot is the biggest thing is we we and I I say to people, lead with love. Um, lead with love. That that is the the most common thing that you hear throughout the Bible is love, love thy neighbor. That is your greatest and one truest commandment. And so that it didn't say love thy neighbor when he suits you or love thy neighbor when it feels good or when it feels right. Or when you feel like it, it says love thy neighbor. That means, and it's period. So no matter what, treat everyone with love the way you want to be treated. And it, and if you can, I think if you can just do that bare minimum, You'll you'll be you'll be in alignment and you'll realize life is a lot easier versus trying to condemn people yourself when when we were born into sin equally. And so you're you're thank you. And and I'm sorry to get get you riled up. I just I wanted to ask. You don't need to apologize for nothing ever. I ain't I ain't the type to get offended. These are things that need to be spoken about. (laughs) But you know, you ever look at these bitter people? I'm not gonna cite certain political affiliations because that doesn't really matter but people who are like bitter and like that person's wrong let's kick kick them out of here they can't stay here you see how them people age they look like shit like they don't look happy like they don't smile like they're always bitter because somebody didn't piss them off because somebody wants to make a free choice in their own life you know that doesn't age them well it's not good for their own health all that negativity they're sending out is being deflected right back onto them. And they're going to reap that shit in their body in this life. True. So true. Mrs. Devan and Hubert, how can we connect with you? How can my audience grow with you? How can they learn more? They simply go to sex, drugs, and Jesus.com. And that holds my podcast, my personal blog, um, all the books that I'm working on. You'll see them on there. Um, there'll be a link soon on there to pack you over to my clothing store down under apparel.com. Uh, and those are my two main websites. And um, the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus is the main one. Absolutely. 
check him out, y'all. This man is the truth. He's spilling all the tea, as you saw in this episode. But we gotta give him back. He got He got He got more books to write, and more people to inspire and encourage and uplift, and to make them aware of what's really going on in the world. Mr. Devan, and I want to say to you, brother, thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for not giving up on life and not giving up and re releasing your memoir and giving back in this way. I consider this a form of community and public service. So thank you, brother, for what you do. And I appreciate you. And I love you. And I thank you for being here and doing what you do. Thank you. I speak blessings and positivity on you and your audience in tremendous amounts. Amen. Thank you, sir. And I hope this message, I hope this helps y'all. I want to say to this to my audience, thank you for tuning in to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. I hope this helps. I hope this encourages. I hope this stimulates the mind and gets you guys going and really allows you to really see beyond what's in front of you. Because this is real life. And this is the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And we want to bring you the truth. And so thank you all for tuning in with us and riding this roller coaster with us. This has been fun and epic. Thank you. Like I always end every, every show, take care of your family, take care of your friends, and always, always take care of business. This is Gentleman Style Podcast, your host, your favorite gentleman, Marcus Norman, and Devannon Hubert signing off. Love you guys. Bye. Bye.